You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. It is Palm Sunday. And I tell you, uh, that is just a little uh, introduction of our message series that we're going to start next week. I know Cheryl will talk to you about Easter. And, and we talk a lot about Easter this time of year. And we, as, especially this week as we're leading up to Easter, we want you to invite your friends. And we want you to come. We're going to start a new message series called I Am Jesus. And really talk about and really focus on who Jesus said he was uh, through those, those seven I Am uh, phrases in the book of John, you know, and so we're, we're going to cut, we're going to dive into that and beginning next week, we're going to start with I am the resurrection and the life because we know that is what Easter is about, the resurrection and the life. But this Sunday is Palm Sunday and, and I tell you, it's just a, it's a, it's an interesting week and I'm going to, over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking to you about what will you do with Jesus? Just a message here as we talked you know, and many, if you remember through the book of, we've been working our way kind of through the book of John, and there are many people that were asking that same question uh, about, in Jesus' day, about what will we do with Jesus? And actually, in, in Mark chapter 15, 12, Pilate asked the people, then what should I do with this man you call the king of Jews? And so really, I've been challenging each of us to ponder that question personally in yourself. And in, in, uh, it, what does that mean to you? What does Jesus mean to you? And what are you going to do with him? What, what have you decided to do with Jesus? So, uh, and once we've made that choice, we, we talk about different things. There are different things that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. The first week, we really started with the decision to believe him. Just really, you know, do, am I really going to believe this guy says that he's the son of God and he's Jesus? And it was really something that people were struggling with in his day of whether or not we were going to believe him. And then we talked last week about following him and, and, and being the good shepherd and, and following his guidance in our life. And so this week, I really want to spend some time talking to you about surrendering our life completely to him. And, uh, uh, you know, this week, the last thing that we, we do with Jesus is to give our life up to him. And to, so today I want to spend some time talking about that. And there's a scripture and in, in, in what that looks like. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse 25 through 26, it says, Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, become my servants, must be where I am, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So the last part of this journey that we want to take this week uh, will, will really be probably the most difficult and probably the one that is going to separate the, the men from the boys. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And as we enter in this week of Palm Sunday, and you think about Palm Sunday and this triumphant in, entry, and if you know anything about the story of Jesus he, he came in uh, on, a, on a donkey and, and people were, you know, laying palms down and saying, you know, praising and rejoicing who he was and, 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 and accepting him as king of the Jews and, and, and laying these palms. And it was this huge celebratory entry into the Passover. And so the, the interesting to, thing to me is when you look at that picture uh, in the scripture, how quickly that changed in a matter of a week. Uh, and how quickly we lead up. So many of you, I don't know if you know that the significance of this week is really important. And we take a look at the life of Jesus and, and really the, the agonizing uh, march, really this week began his walk toward the cross. And really over and over in the book of, of John, you will hear Jesus say things like, now is, and the time has not yet come. The time has not come for me to enter, you know, the time is not ready. The time is not now. When Jesus you know, when Jesus turned the water into the wine, which was one of his first miracles, um, you know, he, he was reluctant to do so because he said, you know, the time has not come. The time is not ready. My time has not come. To, now his time has come. It's the week of his death. And so this one, you know, and sometimes it's kind of, uh, it's a difficult week when you look at it from what Jesus did. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Was One of the things that, that the first thing I want to talk to you about is that new life 
requires the death of an old one. <laughs> and so I want you to think about what that, what that looks like. And just to kind of illustrate this, you know, we have... Um, my wife's kind of a green thumb. She likes to do things around the house and, and, and piddle with the, the plants and all that stuff. And she did a really good job landscaping our backyard by our pool. And we have this pool and it has a tarp on it. But on the back side of the pool, there are these huge grasses. There are these, you see them all the time. These, they get really, really, they're, they're massive. I don't know, there's about five of them back there, five or six of them back there on the back side of the pool. Well, every spring, if you know anything about them, you've got to either whack those things down or uh, burn them, right? And so you have to kill off the dead, the, the dead stuff, because they grow every and then, in the, you know, at the end of the, you know, summer, they get dead, and then they sit out there all winter, and they're just really dry and dead, and, and so what I thought I would do, so in order for that to grow back, in order for that to go, we, you have to whack, the, the, those things are hard to whack down, they're huge, I mean, they're like this big around, one of them, and, and so I'm like, I have tried everything. I'm like, the chainsaw, I mean, seriously, I've done it all. And, and so the first time I thought, somebody said, well, you can burn those. I was like, oh, really? I didn't know you could burn those things. That won't hurt them? They're like, no, no, burn them. Burn them off. Just, just light those babies up. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done that? <laughs> Let me tell you, it goes up like gasoline. I mean, it is like, it is like an inferno. I had no idea that those things would go up like that. Like, so I lit them all. <laughs> Not one at a time. I had no hose or nothing. I wasn't prepared. I just lit all of them. I just like, you know, click, 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 lighter, going all the way down the back side of the pool. And I, you know, I, I kid you not, it was, you know, it's, it's 32 feet, you know, 40 feet uh, across the back side of our pool. And I had 40 feet of just raging inferno. It was huge. <laughs> like the neighbors were like, call the, call the, <laughs> it was just huge. And I was like, okay, that's it. I've burnt the house down. Because the wind was, the wind picked up, and like the, these ashes were blowing everywhere. I mean, they was all, they were landing on the roof of the house, and I could do nothing but watch. And it just giant inferno in my backyard. And so, uh, you know, the pool tarp. We have this like trampoline safety cover on the pool, and um, the, I just watched as all this stuff just landed on the pool tarp and melted my pool. T and it was just yeah. I mean, you go look at the pool; it looks like Swiss cheese. There's like it's like I was laying out there smoking all day on it. Um, but I had to, I didn't know that. So, but I do know, I figured that out. But man, don't light those things. Those are, whew, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad I didn't light the one close to the house. But the, the fact of the matter is, in order for that grass to grow, and, and, and in, in order for that to, to spring up in the spring, it's really cool. Like, I burnt those things to a smithereen, and I thought, oh, man, those things are done for. Those things are never coming back. But a couple weeks later, it started to rain, and we, you know, in the springtime, this time of year, we get rain, and, and, and I went out there about a week later, and I saw that little new shoot of grass, and they're already, I've cut them down this year already, and, I, and I'm always amazed by that. You, I look at it, and I think, man, that, those things are wiped out, because I, I, I just, I torched them, and uh, every year I walk out there, and I see a little shoot of new grass popping up, and every year they grow, and they grow, and grow, and they get bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and ever again, every, they just restore their, so in order, new life requires the death of an old one, and I want to share with you, in John chapter 12, 23, 25, Jesus knew this. Jesus knew going into this week that in order for his will to be done, in order for his will to be done on earth, it required the death of, a, of his life. And, and so this is it. Jesus, Jesus in John chapter 12, verse 23 to, through 25 says this. Jesus replied, now the time has come. All through John, leading up to this point, you hear him say, it's not the time, it's not time, it's not time for me to, it's not time. But now he's like, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and it dies, it remains alone. But, the, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. 
those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Jesus knew that in order to save us, and to spread the love of God, he had to die. And, and so here's the thing. At some point in time in our lives, we have to recognize that if we are going to gain a life, if we are going to do anything outside of this life here on earth, if we're going to do anything with our lives, that we, at some point in time, we have to recognize that life how, that we have now if we just continue to leave it, live it, it's not going to end up in life. We have to come to some type of realization and admit that we're going to move forward. We're going to have to kill some things in our life. There is going to have to be a separation from this life that we have here, the life on earth, the life as we know it. There has to be, in order for something new to grow in your life, something has to die. There has to be a death of some things in our life, and we have to kill that. We have to get beyond this life that we're living here. And so by doing so, if, we, if those of us that have been willing to do that and surrender, we're going to talk about what that looks like. But if you're able to do that in your life and come to a place where you believe Jesus, you're willing to follow him, but are you really, are you really willing to separate your life and make your life his life? Are you willing to kill the your desire for your own life and all of what that looks like for you. Think about what that is for each one of you. But by doing so, we might actually see new life growth, not only in ourselves, but in our families and the friends and the people that we have around us. That's what Jesus did. He knew that if, you know, if, if, I, if, if I die, it's going to result in new life. It's going to pop up. And after his death, people, it spread like wildfire. They thought they could kill it. So what does that look like? What does that look like to, 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 to kill something in our own life? And the trouble is, here's the trouble I think that we have with this, is we want to hold on to the things in this life and we think we can have both. You know, we dress up our messed up life and we come to church and we pretend everything is okay and that nobody will notice. And we want to be able to, we want to come to church and feel good. You know, a lot of us believe in Jesus. We like the idea of Jesus. We like the, the concept of Jesus. We like the concept of God that he saves us from our sins and he loves us where we are and, and all of that. We, we like that, but we, we still like our life outside of here. We still like to leave church, and we still like to go do our own thing, and, and, and really, uh, you know, make decisions and, and, and do things outside when you leave this place, but we still want to try to hold on to both. You can't. You, you know, we, we bring in our little lives, and we come to church, and we think we have this messed up life outside of here, but we come to church, and we pretend like everything's okay, and no one will ever notice. And let me tell you, that's really like putting lipstick on a pig. You can drag your life in here and dress it all up and put on some kind of fake deal for church and you can come in here and you pretend to be this and you can pretend this, you can fake it pretty easily. But really, all you're doing is putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. It's pretty, has lipstick on it, but it's still a pig. We have to come to the point in time in our life where we recognize the things and that we're doing outside of here and the, the, the decisions that we're making outside of here really need to die if we want to experience new growth and new life in our life. When, my question to you this morning is, when will we be honest with ourselves and realize that we need to stop living for this life? So let's talk about losing our life and living his life. Believing but not really doing anything different. You know, I, th I think that some people, um, you know, believe, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I have a group of guys that I, I talk to on Wednesday nights uh, in Youth Loop, uh, and, and it's interesting. I talk to them, you know, and they, you know, they, we'll have a small group, and we talk about how we want to do things and how, we, how do we grow as Christians and how we walk into a deeper life with him and how do we, how do we become, uh, how do we become Jesus. But really, you know what's interesting? I asked them a question, and I just want you to think about the same question. What have you done this week from last Sunday to this Sunday that was any different? Have you done anything significantly to draw closer to a walk with Christ or to do anything for his kingdom? What have you done differently? What decisions have you made that have really been guided by Jesus? You know, I think sometimes I, I have a theory, I call him spare tire Jesus. 
a lot of us have Jesus. We want to we keep him like a spare tire. And it's interesting to me in our society how we, often we see that. You know, we, we, like, to, we like Jesus, but we want to keep him in the trunk. We want to roll around with Jesus in our trunk because if something bad happens and we have a crisis in our life and we get that diagnosis from cancer or we get that diagnosis that a loved one is hurting and we get some kind of tragedy or some kind of tragedy strikes in our life, instantly we fall to our knees. Oh, God, I can't tell you the number of people that have never spoken to me about Jesus at all that will reach out and say, hey, will you pray for me because of this that's going on in my life? It's time to get Jesus out of the trunk. I need to get him out because I, I'm in a crisis. I'm on the side of the road, and I want to get spare tire Jesus out, and I want to put him on, and I want him to make my life everything perfect, but I really don't want, him to, I don't want anybody to see him. I don't want anybody to experience him in my life. I don't, want to, I don't want to invite somebody to church. I don't want to make a decision about how I spend my money or, or how, I, how I do things based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. I just want to keep him in the trunk until I need him. It doesn't work like that. Something in our life has to die for us to really experience growth in our life. Jesus knew it. We should know that. We need to think about, we, we begin to, when we, when we have Jesus in our life, and we, when, we, when we make those decisions and we begin to walk with Jesus in our life, he becomes part of our everyday life, who we hang out with, how we spend our money, how we spend our time. Every single move we make is done consulting Jesus. Jesus, is this what you want me to do? Is this how you would have us spend our money? Is this how you would have me raise my kids? Is this, how, is this really someplace I should be going? Are these people I really should be hanging away, out with? Everything that we do, everything decision we make, it's not about our life. It becomes about a different life. We've got to get beyond this life. We can't see beyond what, what's right in front of us. And I think here's the struggle we have also. It's in John chapter 12, verse 42, 43, and this is sad. It says many, and they're talking about Jesus in the day, and, and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. John chapter 12, 42 through 43 says this, many people did believe in him. However, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. And this is the saddest part to me. For they loved human praise more than they loved the praise of God. Is that you? What a sad picture, but a really... It's a sad picture, but really that's the picture that has remained since that time. That picture hasn't changed from that day to today. The reality is we care more about what people think of us than what, and we care about what God thinks of us. If we didn't, we wouldn't be afraid to raise our hands in church. To let yourself completely be immersed in worship and not be thinking about who's sitting beside you. Because you know what? It's not about who's sitting beside you. It's this right here. It's not on this life. We have to kill this life. We wouldn't be afraid to tell others about him. We wouldn't be afraid to move to an altar and humble yourself in front of everyone and hit your knees. I know these are altars and people are like, oh, that's not, you know, I'm intimidated by that. You know what? At some point in time, we have to kill the things in our life, whether that's fear or whatever it is. Even people in, in Jesus' day were intimidated by their peers. Their lives were being shaped and formed by those around them. So my question is, your life being shaped by anything other than Jesus is your life being shaped by anything other than what Jesus wants for you? You know, when we do that, and here's the other thing. I think when we do that, when you come out and say, you know what, I'm a Christian and I'm going to live this way, and you start making decisions based on what Jesus wants in your life, it begins to impact people around you. And people be around you start treating you different. One of the biggest things that, I, that I've shared this with you before, but one of the biggest challenges for me to become your pastor was I didn't want people to treat me different because of who I was, because I was a pastor. Let me ask you this, do people treat you different because of your walk with Christ, or do they even know? Do they even recognize him in your life? 
Do, when people cuss around you, do they say, oh, I'm sorry? Because that's what they do to me. Not that I care. But it, but it really needs to reflect that. So what part of your life needs to die? Ask yourself that this morning. Is it your relationships? Are there people that are continually pulling you in the wrong directions? Is it a habit, hurt, habit, or hang-up that needs to be crucified in your life? Is it pride? We think that there's some honor in always being composed. Oh, don't break down. Don't let anybody show you. It's some form of weakness. Negative attitudes, fear, discontent, whatever it is, in order for something to grow in your life, it requires death. The second thing I want to share with you this morning is losing your life and predicting your death is difficult. You ever notice that? <laughs> when there's one thing in your life that you know you need to kill, it's hard, right? Especially if it's something that you're fond of, like your life or, or, or something else. Have you ever wondered how you would die? Anybody ever thought about that? It's not something really I think about a lot, but every now and then it crosses my mind. I've always felt like that I was going to do that I was, I, I've always felt like I'm going to die some weird way. Like I'm going to pluck a nose hair and it's going to get infected and then I'm out. <laughs> it's going to be, I, I've always felt like it's just going to be some weird random thing like that. And I was like, man, who knew? No, nose hair, you know. I've always thought it was going to be something weird like that. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Probably not something we think about often. But I want, to, I, want to, I want to talk about something else. Have you ever really dreaded something? I mean really dreaded something that you knew was going to be so bad and you knew it was going to be so hard that you were just like, ugh, I just, I, I just do not want to do this. You ever been there? You ever dreaded, absolutely dreaded with your entire being? It's where Jesus was this week. He knew his time had come. Let me share some things. Jesus was about, right now, today, Jesus was about a week away from his death, and he had finally come to the realization that he was going to face an agonizing death. He had come face to face with his destiny, and it had become the time to face the music. And, and, and so here's, here's the thing that he said. John chapter 12, 23, he, Jesus replied, "'Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory.'" And making a choice, let me tell you this, making a choice to lose your life, that means, for us, that means separating what, everything, our wants and our desires and everything that we want and everything that we have planned for our lives, taking that and chucking out the window. That's hard. It's hard to do. It was hard for Jesus, literally. I want to share this. John chapter 12, 27 says this. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. I want you to listen to the first part of that. Now my soul is deeply troubled. He dreaded it. He knew what he was facing. Let me tell you, I've been reading a book. There's, I was reading just a, this week a little book called The Case for Christ. I don't know if you've ever read that book. But it's a book, uh, it, it's a basically, uh, I think he, Lee Strobel writ, writ, wrote the book. Um, uh, he was an author, basically, and, and, and he, was, he was basically an atheist. But he wrote this book based, and journaled his journey into believing in Christ. And so what he did is he did extensive research on Jesus and who he was and building a case for Christ. And part of that book talks about the crucifixion. And he met with numerous like scholars, scientific scholars. He, he met with one doctor who uh, had degrees, not only a medical degree, but also had an engineering degree. And he met with this doctor and he began to just ask him questions about the crucifixion. And really, if you read through the story of Jesus, you know that when he, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Scripture tells us that he actually sweat blood. Have you ever dreaded anything so bad that you sweat blood? And so, so Lee, in his book, asked the doctor about this phenomenon. Truth, it, it, it's actually a medical condition. It only happens, very rarely does it happen, but it happens when people are so psychologically distressed 
and over dread or something in their life that their capillaries burst and they actually begin to sweat drops of blood. He went on to say that not only does it actually happen, but it, it, it would have made, when that condition occurs medically, it would have made your skin extremely sensitive to touch. So then when Jesus was flogged using a whip that had ball bearings in it so that it would bruise and make contusions and pieces of bone that they said would actually, not to be too graphic, but would actually shred your skin to where your entrails would come out. And there would be quivering strips of muscle. Jesus knew what he was facing. And he willingly walked toward it. That blows my mind. Have you ever dreaded anything that bad? I was sharing this morning with the, the, the band. Worst thing I've ever, I think about the, some of the decisions that I've had to make in my life, nothing compares to that. Pales in comparison to that. Making a choice to lose your life is hard. Have you ever stopped to think about what kind of courage and mental toughness it took for Jesus to willingly walk into the kind of death that he was facing. And I think sometimes, you, you know, as Christians, we want to we we talk about Easter, and we want to focus on the resurrection, and that is the focus. And sometimes we want to skip over the cross to get to Easter. The fact of the matter is, this week for Jesus was brutal. This holy week leading up was agonizing, not only physically, but emotionally, psychologically. His disciples were betraying him. Peter was, Peter was denying that he even knew him. I just want to ask you this morning, what death is staring you in the face today? We have trouble walking away from harmful relationships. Here's the thing, guys and girls, I don't know if you have any in here, but if you are dating people that are not on the same page spiritually with you, then that relationship needs to die before it's, because it's not going to go anywhere. Anywhere good. Some of us need to walk away from our career and our money and our lifestyles. We need to put to death of that. But the mere thought of that, I want each one of you to think about that one thing that you have that would be like, oh, be tough for me to get rid of that. I don't, know how I, could, I don't know how I could possibly do that, Trent. And then I want you to think about those things. Is it your family? Is it your friends? Is it your marriage? Grief that's just crippling you? What death are you facing, dreading, that might not ever, that you think you're never going to overcome? What is it in your life that the thought of it would possibly make you sweat blood? Is there anything like that in your life? I want you to think about those things, and then uh, the fact of the matter is, losing your life is hard. Not a, and I don't think any of us could probably relate to the, the kind of agony and the, and the thought that Jesus had in losing his life, his physical life. I think for us, it really just is about losing the things that we're comfortable with. Losing the things that we want to hold close. Losing the things that we say, Jesus, you can have everything but this. I want to hold on to this. When you get to a point in your spiritual life where you say, you know what? I'm willing to give it all up. It's a whole different level. And you experience Christ like you've never experienced him before. When we as a church begin to realize that we are not living this life for us, let me go back and read that scripture at the beginning I read. John 12, 25, 26. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing of their life in this world will keep it for eternity. I want to get to a point where I could care less about this life. I don't, care what God, I, don't, I don't care if I have a great house or a great car. I want to get to a point where I don't care about, I want to care about what God wants me to do. 
I want to be focused on eternity and focused on my life with Christ more than I'm focused on this life here on earth and who Trent Ice is in Salem, Illinois. That's where we've got to get to. That's what I'm talking about, losing your life. When, when things of this earth are a priority over things of Christ and this church and, and his kingdom and his work and what he's called us to do, that's a problem. We all should have that sense of urgency. There should be some sense of urgency about what we're doing here. So I'm going to ask Jeremy to come play for a minute. I'm going to just have you guys sit in your seat. The last thing I want to share with you this morning thing that Jesus said in the scripture before when he knew what he was facing John chapter 12 verse 23 he said now the time has come what keeps us from being able to surrender our life right now what is it what is it that's keeping you from surrendering your entire life and saying, you know what, God, I don't care. Whatever you have for me, I'm good with. You want me to be a missionary and go to Africa? I'll be a missionary and go to Africa. You want me to invite my friend to church? I'll go invite my friend to church. You want me to apologize to my family for the way I've acted? I'll apologize to my family. You want me to reconcile that that broken relationship that's in our life? I'm going to do it. You want to go and take the high road and say sorry to somebody that I really don't feel like I need to say sorry to? I'm going to do it. You want me to make my finances? You want me to start doing things different and start selling things in my life that I need to make my, my, my finances a priority? I'm going to do it. You want me to start volunteering and helping at the church? I'm going to do it. You want me to go to CR? I'm going to do it. That's what losing your life looks like it's doing what god wants you to do not what we want to do and not what's comfortable you think it was comfortable for jesus to walk toward that it wasn't john chapter 12 35 through 36 says this jesus replied my light will shine for you just a little longer (laughs) Walk in the light while you still can. I love that. So the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of light. Are you ready to experience something new and fresh in your life? If so, you need to do something about it now. Walk in the light while you still can. Not tomorrow. Not next Sunday. Not in the next minute. You have to act now. I want everybody to prowl their heads. Are you willing to lose your life? To find it? So that things in your life can grow? I challenge you with that scripture again. Jesus says, my light will not will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of light. And I know this message is heavy, but it was heavy for Jesus. This week, as they walk toward the cross, what will you do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? Are you going to serve him? Are you going to give him your life? Are you going to believe him? Are you going to follow him? It really comes down to that. And these altars are open. And you can come and pray, and you don't have to come here and pray, but you can. But I want to pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, I just, I'm overwhelmed at the 
sacrifice that you made for me, that you willingly walked to an agonizing death, that you chose to lose your life, that you chose to give up your life so that we might have life. God, I just thank you so much for, for each one of us, Lord. Help us to overcome our pride. Help us to overcome relationships in our life. Help us to set aside our lives and put our lives and our agenda on hold and just actually kill it, God. God, I just pray that you would help us to, to overcome the things that we have in our lives and just continue to live for you and you only. Help us to seek you in every decision that we make. Lord, I just pray that... Um, Maybe there's somebody here that hasn't made that decision yet. And maybe there's somebody sitting in this church that, that says, Trent, you know what? I, I know I really need to do that. I need help. I just pray that they would pray this prayer. If you're that person, just pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I give you my life. It's hard, God, but I want to give up the things that I know are keeping me from you. God, help me to surrender that to you. Come into my life, Lord, so that I might know you. God, I just pray that there's somebody here that prayed that prayer. If there's somebody here, just slip your hand up so I can see you, or I just want to pray for you. Yep, I see it. I see him. Anybody else brave enough to raise their hand and say, you know what? I've asked Christ into my life. I've rededicated my life. Let me pray for you. God, I just pray for these people that have raised their hand. God, we know that you have the power to save because of the death on the cross. Lord, I just pray that you would come into their life, that you would fill their lives. God, I ask these things. God, I pray, Lord, as we leave this place today and as we take steps out of here to move forward in our life, Lord, that we can trust you and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've saved us from our sins and that we have the resurrection to look forward to. And God, as we march toward next week and Easter, God, I pray that you would just help us to invite people, help us to be Jesus to those around us this week, that somebody might come to know you because we chose to give our life to you and to lose it. Lord, I thank you so much for our church. I thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to be called children of God. Go with us, I pray. And I pray these things in your name.